Hello, I'm Rebecca the Maths Lady, here to help you become an expert primary maths teacher so that all your children love maths and become fluent, creative and confident with it. This is the fourth video in the series on teaching maths to children who are six or six to seven years old and this one focuses on the number square. In this video I'll start by looking in detail at the structure of the number square and the alternative structures of it and we'll look at the different reasons why children find it difficult to deeply understand it and how we overcome those barriers. Then I'll talk about how we get children to come to deeply know the number square so they've got one in their imagination. I'll explain how we help children to become fluent at their two, five and ten times tables with the number square. I'll talk about adding and subtracting multiples of 10. So adding 10 and subtracting 10, adding 20 and subtracting 20. And I'll explain how we teach children to add and subtract 9 and 11, 19 and 21 and so on using the shortcuts that you can see on the number square. Right, let's get started by talking about the deepest controversy of number squares. Should one be in that corner or that corner? The answer is it doesn't really matter. On balance, people who've thought about it seem to prefer having one down here because you have a sense that as numbers get bigger, you go up. But the most important thing is that you're consistent. So if you've got number squares on worksheets, number squares on your interactive whiteboard, if you've got numbers in pockets on a pocket number square, if you've got a number square in the yard, you need to make sure they're all consistent when children are six to seven years old. We'll be able to vary them later on. I really do recommend you get a number square painted in the yard if you can. You might just want to do one in chalk, but if you are going to get one painted, you want to think about it carefully and make a decision and stick with it. OK, now let's talk in depth about this structure. And for the comments I'm going to make now, it really doesn't matter whether one is here or here. The previous video before this one was about the counting beads. I do recommend you watch that video first. So if you haven't seen it, here's a link to it now. And when I'm running live training, we work on the counting beads and then we work on the number square. And I ask teachers to identify the difference between this structure and this structure. And most of them immediately see that instead of the tens being in a line, the tens are resting on top of each other. And that's a very obvious difference. But there are more differences than that. With this structure, 27 would have been represented by 27 beads. That's cardinal number. It's a set of 27 things. With this structure, 27 is represented by a single number here. That's ordinal number. That is the 27th number. Now that's a big shift. Some children will cruise through that. They really won't find it a problem at all. But it is a big mental shift. And you can do some work that will really help children if you do work with real objects, 27 real objects, if you put them on the number square, you see the set of 27 that brings you to here. I love my penguins on ice. When you're counting penguins, as I explained in the last video, you have these icebergs that help to group them into tens. And when we were replicating the counting beads, we joined them end to end like that. But when we start to organise them as a number square, we join them sideways on like this. We can quickly build the whole number square. And now when we show 27, when we pop the penguins on, you are actually going to see 27 penguins. And the last penguin will be in the space with the number 27. So this kind of activity is going to help you bridge the gap between cardinal number 27 being a set of 27 things, an ordinal number where 27 is a single number, it's the 27th number. Of course you don't need to explain that explicitly to children but I'm just saying it's a really good idea to give them numbers of objects up to 100 objects and to get them to put them on their number square so they make that connection that 59 is a lot of objects and they completely fill the first five rows and most of the sixth row. The other thing that's changed, the first thing was that the tens are on top of each other instead of end on. The second was that we shifted from cardinal number to ordinal number. The third is that here we are leading with the numbers being written as digits. And that is a big barrier for some children. You will have children who are struggling with dyslexia, who are going to 
find it really difficult to spot easily the difference between 14 and 41. And it's very important that you watch them and make sure you spot those children and make sure that they are working with their arrow cards, which I explained in the last video. At this stage, it is so crucial for those children that they deeply understand what is going on. If you're talking about 53, they should be quickly putting it together with their arrow cards so they know, they can see it, they're confident, they're in control, just like all the other children. They just need this little extra resource to get there because if you don't give them that resource they need, they're going to start to think of themselves as being terrible at maths, set up psychological barriers to learning really quickly because these children will be struggling. So there were three barriers in making the shift from here to here that we've just talked about. We're using a different shape, we're using ordinal numbers rather than cardinal numbers and we need to bridge the gap, and we're writing our numbers as digits instead of showing them with objects. And for some children that will present a barrier that we need to help them to overcome. Right, the next thing is that every child needs to come to have this number square in their imagination so it's always there for them. They can always access it even when they don't have it written down. So the first thing is that you want to show children numbers of objects. You might use your penguins on ice, you might use your counting beads, you might name the numbers, you might show them with digits or you might show them in words. And in the last video I mentioned that you can put together number names with just cards for the names of the tens and cards for the names of the ones and you just pick one of each at random. There we go, 34. The children would have to find that number on their square. You will find these and these in my free to download worksheets. Obviously you could make your own very quickly but I thought I might as well share them for free download to save you some time if that's useful to you. And here's the link where you can find all those free downloads. So time and again, and in different ways that are diagnosing different aspects of children's learning, you need to make children hunt around this number square until they can find any number quickly. And they're starting to see the patterns. And you can show them sets of numbers in a column or in a row, and they've got to be able to find them. And then you can move on to number squares like this, with most of the numbers missing and ask them to fill in the numbers, or you can point to a particular square and ask them which number is there. And they've got to puzzle that out. And here's a nearly completely empty one with just one number starting it off that's even more of a challenge. And I've shared that worksheet too. So before you start to do maths with the number square, you need to make sure that every child deeply knows their number square and can find any number on it very quickly, even when most of the squares are empty. And of course you can link this to practicing writing digits and if that's a skill your children need to work on I recommend the communication for all number cards. If you just google this you should be able to find them quickly for free download and they're excellent. Right let's do some maths. So with the counting beads we got our children counting in twos, fives and tens and now we want to do the same on the number square. So we give them number squares and we ask them to colour in the numbers that are in the twos the numbers that are in the fives and the numbers that are in the tens on different number squares so they can start to see these really clear patterns that emerge which look like this. I've not got the one for the tens but obviously that's just this single column here. And then what you want to do is get children counting in twos and physically moving their hands to show the twos. Two, four, six, eight, ten and then up a row. 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And of course, while they're doing that, they're watching this number square to help them. And then they can do the same with their fives. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so on, moving up a row each time with their hands. And what you're aiming for is for you to be able to switch off your number square and the children should still be able to do that action because they're still seeing that number square in their imagination. Then the next step is for them to be able to slow down and say, one two is two, two twos are four, three twos are six, and they're still moving their hands in the same way, but they're keeping track on how many twos they've got, or how many fives they've got, or how many tens they've got if they're just counting up the side. It's really tricky, but you've got these children for a year and that's the journey that you need to take. Ultimately, children should be able to choose between whether they're imagining counting beads or whether they're imagining number squares when they're doing their tables. But it is a really good idea to make time to teach both of these thoroughly 
before they choose because when you teach maths with two structures and you deliberately make the links and children make those links between those two structures they develop a really deep understanding of maths so when you're working on your tables in this way do bring out the counting beads or the big bead rack and move it at the same time and show the links as to how those counting beads fit into here Right, adding and subtracting with the number square. So if we're in the classroom, we might put a counter on a square to show where we're starting. And we might ask, what's two more or two less? And we want children to physically move the counter. It's wonderful if they're in the yard and they can all pick a number to start on and you shout two more and they all have to move. It's a much more powerful learning experience. Can't recommend it highly enough. And then a key calculation we want to work on is 10 more or 10 less. And if your children are physically moving, some of them will want to move 10 squares on, run round the number square, carry on, whereas others will just step up the grid one square. And children love shortcuts, so they'll be fascinated about why there's a shortcut there. And again, you can build it with apparatus. If you're using your penguins on ice, you can show you're just adding a 10. So the whole block is moving up one layer because you put one more iceberg on the bottom and then you can talk about 10 less. Then it's great to come back into the classroom and do it with counters. If we put a counter on 38, we can talk about what's 10 more and what's 10 less, or 20 more or 20 less. And then the final fabulous part of this bit of maths at this age is to talk about adding nine or 11 or subtracting nine or 11. And to help children develop the idea that if they're adding nine, they're going to be moving diagonally like that because they are doing the same as adding 10 and subtracting one, or they're just adding one less than 10, so they're not quite getting to the number that's directly up. Get them having those conversations. Just tell them to add nine, and then get them to chat about what's happening, and then encourage them to tell you. And similarly, if you're adding 11, well, that's one more than 10, so we're going that way. Or we can add 10 and then add one. And if they can cope with those, then you move on to exploring, subtracting nine, subtracting 11, adding 19, adding 21, subtracting 19, subtracting 21, and so on. Now, when we added nine with the counting beads, we would have partitioned the nine. So if we were adding nine to 58, we would have added two to get to 60. And then, well, we've used two of the nine, so there's seven left. So then we would have got to 67. And it's really worth making the links between those two methods. And this is the joy of the number square. It gives you access to these super shortcuts that aren't obvious with the counting beads. That's it on the number square. I hope you have loads and loads of fun working on it with your class. If you have any questions or comments, please do post them in the questions or comments about this video. Please do consider sharing it with your colleagues or anyone who might be interested, either people you know or in social media groups. I hope you'll join me again soon for the next video in this series, which is on teaching multiplication and division using array with this age group. And we'll also talk about how array is used to teach children to reason about adding and subtracting odd and even numbers. It's definitely a topic that's worth deeply understanding if you're gonna teach maths to children aged six or six to seven. Hope to see you again soon. Have a good day, bye for now.